Welcome to Living Your Greatness. Each episode, we bring on great people to inspire you to achieve your greatness. We discuss topics all related to health and wellness. Listen to world-class stories, learn valuable lessons, and turn knowledge into action. It is now time for you to unlock your inner greatness. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Living Your Greatness. This is your host, Ben Mummy, and today we have a new guest to the show, and her name is Jillian Brown. For those of you who don't know Jillian, she is a Canadian-born adventure photographer. Diagnosed with PTSD, she has used this to fuel her drive to connecting others to nature, adventure, and themselves. She is particularly known for her niche of taking cameras to the extremes of paddling and remote expeditions accompanied by stories of her personal journeys along the way. So Jillian, welcome to Living Your Greatness. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to have a conversation with you today about, you know, all of your uh, successes, as well as some failures and uh, everything that you're doing these days, you know, to advocate for mental health. So Jillian, let's kind of kick off here. Can you tell us about yourself? Where did you spend your formative years growing up in Canada? What inspired you to become a photographer? And do you remember your first camera that you ever held in your hands? So I grew up kind of half my time in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where I went to school. And then the rest of the time, I was out on a small island in northwestern Ontario on Lake of the Woods. And that's where I got to grow up with my great grandparents, grandparents, um, for a time, cousins and aunt and uncle, um, which is re- really where that whole, for one, work ethic was instilled in me. But also, of course, being on a tiny island, the love of water and paddling and all things to do with the outdoors. Um, Once I was 10, um, my family did a road trip across from Manitoba um, to London, Ontario, and I was given my first camera. And it was like a little Crayola plastic yellow camera. And I probably took hundreds of photos. And when we got them developed, not a single one turned out. And there was one in particular along one of the lakes, probably Lake Superior, where there was this grand ship that was coming out of the fog. It was like a tall ship, so a sailboat, essentially. And it was coming out of this dense fog. And I remember taking the photo, and that was the only one that I cared about. And of course, none of them worked. And I swore I would never miss those kind of moments again and let that happen. So as soon as I could, I started working in a dark room, so 12 years old. And I focused my entire schooling on school places where I could study photography, um, as well as fine arts. I was an artist as well. Um, so I went to specific high schools and things so that I could do both of those. And then studied fine arts in university for a bit, um, where I kind of struggled a little just because I had been studying those things for so long that they start you from the very basics the first couple of years. You don't even get to touch a camera. And I was just repeating things that I had already done so much that um, mentally it was really hard on me. And uh, so I ended up taking time off and um, did this crazy, awesome canoe trip out in Quebec, actually, for two weeks, which kind of reinvigorated me and got back. And as soon as I got back, I applied to this private photography school and I got accepted their last spot they just so happened to have somebody drop out and they accepted me and did this intensive photography program and when I was finished that and graduated I again was feeling kind of unmotivated and struggling um, not inspired so much being in Manitoba and so my dad invited me to go on a business trip to Vancouver with him and rented a car and toured up the the Sea to Sky Highway, it's called, from Vancouver through Squamish, Whistler, and Pemberton. And I completely fell in love with the place. And a week later, I had packed up my things and drove out and moved to Squamish. Um, That was 2010, and I haven't left British Columbia since, or at least moved somewhere from British Columbia. (laughs) Thanks for sharing us a little bit about your background there, hearing about your photography as well as, you know, your childhood there growing up and going through that journey there, you know, across Canada. And then also hearing about how you caught the BC bug. I know you're a very adventurous person, right? 
So you've talked about your photography, but when did you decide to combine your passion for adventure with your love towards photography? So that was pretty early on. Um, I was always very, very passionate. And that definitely was passed down to me from everyone in my family. Um, When we have something we love um, from sailing, both my parents were sailors competitively and taught it. That's how they met, was teaching sailing. And we grew up with a bunch of different sailboats. My grandma loved canoeing. So when she was 17, she saved up her money to buy herself a canoe, which is the same canoe that I learned to paddle in. Um, And very determined, stubborn, and passionate, all of us. And very supportive of whether that passion is mainstream or not. Like a photographer, fine arts is not necessarily so mainstream. So that whole love of photography and integrating it into being out in nature and and adventure was right away. My camera was with me every walk I did from my cabin out to photograph deer. It went in my kayak immediately, got my first kayak when I was 15. And I'd be out every single day paddling in the marshes by our cabin, photographing the turtles, whatever I could find. Um, So that it was a pretty immediate thing. And I knew then that that was how I was going to do my photography was outdoors, no matter what. Um, And I was a competitive athlete growing up too, soccer player, volleyball, all of that too. So um, once, once I left that due to some injuries and got out to BC, it kind of made sense for me to somehow push myself um, since I was no longer doing those kind of team sports, um, do personal personal goals essentially and bring the camera along for them um so that's been around for a while and once I moved to British Columbia um the first job other than a a live-in nanny was um working for a snowmobile company which also had a dog sled touring portion and I was hired as a photographer for that side of it and totally fell in love with dog sledding um working with the dogs and, and then the mushers, there was a great group up there and started a relationship with one of those mushers. Um, so I was able to take photos and dog sled for years all the time. Um, and then him and I started our own dog sled company. We bred a bunch of dogs um, while we were in Squamish. And then we decided to start our own dog company in Golden, British Columbia. Um, which was when I was 15, the first place I swore I would move. Um, So I got to check that off the list. And we went and rescued sled dogs from all over Canada and started our own little little company out there um, for a little bit. So got to do, again, shared nature, the history of the area. Um, Yeah, all about David Thompson and the Columbia wetlands um, side of things. And then, yeah, be out dog sledding and taking photos every day for for a long while there i'm also a photographer myself i i do a little bit i'm super into shooting people places things but i definitely have a huge appreciation or i could definitely relate and i'm sure there's other people listening to right now that can relate with that experience of you know connecting with nature having creative pursuits and combining them together right because It doesn't only, it's not only like the the process of, you know, yet being active or getting outdoors, but it also gives you something to look forward to during like the moment. And then after the moment has happened, right? Because you have a memory, you have a photo of it. So something that I actually want to ask you is what is it that you want to say with your photographs and how do you actually get your photographs to do that? I think kind of every, everything sometimes has different meaning, of course. So, um, Often if it's wildlife, trying to showcase um, that, that beauty and the hidden beauty and the availability that we have to access those things um, and to, to share or speak for that, the wildlife kind of thing. And a lot of those, like the places, the lands that I go to, um, like up Northern Alaska um, are usually places that are being removed from protection or have some sort of threat that really the threat is because nobody knows anything about those areas so it's a lot easier for us to kind of brush them aside so usually for those it's trying to showcase the beauty that's there and the reasons behind needing to protect it um 
whether it be like something really cute and innocent, like a little prairie dog um, that is a species up there that would be annihilated if a road was put in kind of thing um, for the, the native communities that would be, again, destroyed their culture if if there was all of a sudden road access to a uh, fly-in community. Um, mm. So sharing those those stories that, that aren't told. Um, and then when it comes to expedition and adventure, the trying to showcase the emotion that's attached to it. So so either the hardship of it, the the reality is of it, because a lot of people, we get messages all the time as adventurers and things or photographers saying, I want your life. It looks so amazing. You're always outdoors. How do you do that? Like I'm stuck in an office all the time and trying to show that, well, the, the, the reality is for one, there's a lot more in front of the computer and typing and stress than anyone realizes, but also the pain, the, the cold, the dirtiness, the, the fear of potentially an animal, those kind of things, trying to share that in a the story in an image. Um, so they're not always beautiful. I call them, um, I always say capturing grit and beauty in a candid moment because you try to showcase it so people want to look at the images. They're, they don't turn people away, but that they show, yeah, that that grit kind of thing within it and it keeps you captivated in the image. Keeping like a lot of the the moments that you've captured raw and kind of real, right? And feeding off that experience. Yeah. And uh, I'm definitely curious too, you kind of commented that you're, you're doing this on the go, right? Which is not easy, right? You have to assume that hopefully a connection or cellular data or all those things are working well. You also have such a tiny screen, right? To look at, because you probably don't always have your laptop, right? When you're going on these journeys. But at the same time, the beauty of how evolution has kind of happened right now for photography, you are actually able to use technology, right? To have an impact and to inspire or tell stories, right? And be this kind of creative figure, you know, to, to help inspire people. Right. Which I think is great. How do you do it? Like, do you use Lightroom? Like, what are your tools? What's your magic trick? Um, I'm definitely a Lightroom user. I am not tech savvy for one, but I like my images to look as real and raw as you just described as possible. So I don't want them to be, look like a painting or to, to be all photoshopped and get rid of the like spot of, of rain that's on your lens. I want that in there. I want that to be part of the story because that is part of the story. So I'm as simplistic as I can be. So the colors you're seeing are as close to the natural colors as I could possibly capture um, and bring out. And then if there's a black and white image, it's generally because I've seen it that way when I shot it, I knew that it would be more impactful as black and white and that's how I was envisioning it when I took the photo already um but the yeah I'm, I'm such a, I'm tried to be as simplistic as possible um I miss being in the dark room I I absolutely loved it um doing the dodging and burning and and being so hands-on and again it felt so much more raw and real um but nowadays it's just so impractical um having to do that and then scan it in and you'd still end up on a computer anyways to actually show it off. Um, yeah. And then the availability and the ease of, of being able to take a digital camera and put your little cards in a protective case rather than a whole bunch of canisters, that side of things, which is still fun when you summit some mountains, people leave little notes in their old film canisters and they'll be hide hidden under the rocks, which is so amazing to find. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's super rad. Like a lot of the photos that you've shared and, and I, I appreciate like keeping that raw feel and not over editing, I think says a lot about you. It says that, you know, uh, you're obviously a very authentic person. So something that I also want to kind of add on here, you are also an excellent writer and also a storyteller. What has been your most memorable adventure? I know you've done a lot and I know they're all special in their own way. And why was this experience stand out compared to others? Yeah, that would be hard to just pinpoint one because every single one of them from, yeah, paddling across America was just incredible because of the people along the way. I, I mean, all of it, the diversity in the ecosystems, the, the wildlife that I had, had always want, dreamed of seeing um, and encountering like that. Um, 
and then yeah to the to the one after I left that whole dog sled company um thing and that partner and um was in the tent and then a year later I did a a road trip across Canada I mean that was that was hugely life-changing that was the first time I started sharing my story and started to actually write in particular um and it just it reconnected me to everything myself um paddling um photography nature again um and and a lot of the experiences I had along that journey um were were really guiding me to where I am now for sure so that one has a huge impact um yeah and then the one like the one that I talk least about um the 50 days um through Alaska and the Yukon and British Columbia um with 45 days of rain and blizzards and sandstorms and yellow everything hypothermia everything you could imagine on that one there was no and and it was the most remote no cell service nothing no laptop along just down res um yeah everything from pack rafting to mountaineering on that um that one I don't talk very much about I almost forget about it but it probably was the one that pushed me the hardest um and really yeah has some pretty good stories I guess some pretty yeah, hard stories. <laughs> um, yeah, to the Grand Canyon, which of course was crazy amazing. Um, and something yeah, I never really had on my bucket list or thought would ever happen. So yeah, they're all, they're all, they all have amazing stories and are all the best. <laughs> Just want to rewind you a bit here. So yeah, sure. you said that you had some incredible stories within this journey. What was one example of one of these stories, especially since you said that, you know, you don't talk about this off. So the Alaska one, oh gosh. Um, well, the fact that we had done research on weather and the caribou migration and all of that side of things to time it for when we went up and we saw uh, like two caribou and they were both like sickly ill <laughs> and that was it. Um, and it was supposed to be like super nice weather and the driest month and it just poured the entire time. Um, that part of it and the river then that we were paddling. So we, we had planned to be 30 days paddling this remote river in Northern Alaska. And the gentleman who had, who had asked me to, to kind of guide on this, he had a fear of water. He had never paddled before. That's why he had asked if I would take him and be there and teach him. Um, and when the weather just turned crap, um, the goal of then mountaineering, he does solo mountaineering. So it's kind of the, the whole thing was he wanted to use this river to access mountains and because of the weather, we couldn't do any. So it was just, let's just paddle as basically hard as we can. Cause for one, we need to stay warm. My dry suit had been weeping. So this dry suit was actually not sealed properly when it was made. So all the seams weep. So water would just come through and it was raining so hard that it was weeping. It was like I was underwater in this thing. And so I was just soaked. And because it was raining all the time, all my clothes were soaked other than my sleeping clothes, which you never risk putting on just to be dry. You just keep them in your tent all the time, like keep them dry. So you have something um, warm. And so I was every day putting on all my wet clothes and then my dry suit and then my rain jacket over my dry suit <laughs> to try just a little bit to stay warm. Um, and there was one day it just was so it was pouring so bad and it was just whipping whipping wind and we're paddling and there was good current at this point the river had completely flooded you could watch the sides of it collapsing in and eroding and you're moving you should be moving pretty good but the wind was like blowing you backwards almost if you didn't paddle we're paddling along and it got to be like minus seven out it was so cold with that wind chill um so we both started to get hypothermic the gentleman had had frostbite he had more circulation due to it so he was struggling to even hold his paddle so we're like screw it we just got to stop wherever there's a spot that we can actually get out um so we pull into this little like sandy bit and you could watch the water coming up it was rising so fast so pull our stuff immediately up onto this kind of cliff area and there's almost like this nice trail and we're like oh this is perfect and then we realize as we're there we're, we set up just the the tent fly so great about those MSR tents. You can set up just the fly and be under it and get into your dry clothes, not get wet and not get your tent wet and then set up your tent inside it. It's pretty, um, 
So we set that up and then we kind of clue in after we've warmed up a little bit, got not, not shaking. Um, we couldn't even undo our zippers properly because, because of it. Um, we could barely talk because we were shaking and doing the like slurring. Uh, we realized that we're on a bear trail, a grizzly bear trail. And it's just all, that's what's padded down. And it's all grizzly bear tracks. And we'll walk like 10 feet and there's just fresh bear scat everywhere. We look across the river and there's grizzly bears walking across the river. I think, oh my gosh. Well, at this point, we just ha- we're just going to have to deal with it. We're going to, there's no way to get back in the water now. Um, yeah, we, we ended up spending the fracking night there. Um, and numerous grizzly bears walked by on the other side of the river um, and just down from us. But yeah, they at least left us, to, us alone. Um, that was a cold one. That was a good one for sure. That is a crazy story. I feel like other individuals who are listening right now are, are like, is this a dream? Like, did this actually happen? Like, <laughs> yeah. this is crazy. Yeah. And it just, it just yeah. shows you too, right? Like there was things in your control, which is your skill set, right? Knowing how to adapt to, okay, weather, kind of like you were saying, like changing like different suits and stuff like that, or where you're going to set up. And, but at the same time, there was so much outside of your control, right? The animals, so the bears and the the rain and, yeah. and even this partner, right? First time, you know, going on an adventure with him. So that is crazy. But I'm so glad that, you know, yeah. you guys got through it and it's, it's what makes it a really great story to be told. Right. There's so much like the mountaineering parts of that trip. We're just, we summited three, like just after that, a week later, we summited three mountains in three days in the Yukon. And I never thought I would be one that was summiting mountains ever um, did that. And then, yeah, the final day we tried to, after the 50th day, we tried to summit the tallest mountain in Southwestern BC and got up there and it was a crazy blizzard and we wait, tried to wait it out and we both started shivering. And like, Man, it's not, it's not leaving. Let's get down and got down and we just packed up camp and it had taken us two days to hike to the base to start the summit. And we went all the way down, broke camp and then hiked that two day hike out all in one day, all in one day, <laughs> tried to summit, then summited down or descended, packed up and went all the way back down and got out middle of the night yellow jacket stings and just soaked yeah it was that one was a good one <laughs> I was like okay that's a good ending to this epic ridiculous journey <laughs> oh absolutely I actually want to talk about another journey which I know you speak about a lot and I think you refer to it as like your canoeing journey where you experience a lot of highs and lows on this trip probably like most trips right all these expeditions but you really did make a deeper connection at this time of your life with nature and you met some incredible people along the way. Um, And I think at one point you mentioned that you met this special squirrel. So I want to know more about this special squirrel who came into your life. And I also want to know about apparently he or she taught you a lot about the meaning of life. So what were you going through at this time? What were some of the highs and lows of this trip? You know, the experiences and what did this squirrel teach you? Yeah. So so that squirrel story is from the trip I did where I drove across Canada. I lived in my Jeep for 77 days. Um, and it was a journey of rediscovery and reconnection kind of thing. Um, it was a one year kind of anniversary of leaving this abusive relationship with that partner that we did the dog sledding together. And, um, and I, I, I felt, I thought I was healed. I thought I was doing well. Um, but I still, hadn't reconnected to everything that I really loved. So I left even my dog behind and needed this to be completely for me. Um, Goals of paddling in every province, all the Great Lakes, and chatting with my family, sharing what I had been through because I hadn't opened up yet with them. Um, And then getting back into photography and nature and paddling, all of that side of it. Anyways, by the time I got to Quebec, I don't speak French for one. And I was staying out of all major cities. So I was in small town Quebec, which is, is pretty French. And um, I hadn't talked to anyone in two weeks. And I hadn't seen any real wildlife in two weeks. And I was ready to scrap all of my goals and just turn around and head back. It was cold. There was still snow in the mountains. I was in um, Gaspé National Park there. There was still snow. It was still closed. Um, yeah, I camped out in my Jeep that one night. And I woke up. I was by the Salmon River there. And 
like I'm, I'm going home. I'm turning around. Started boiling my water for, for my oats. I did every morning. And above me was this fluffy little squirrel in the tree. I took my camera out and take a couple of photos. Oh, good morning, fluffy little squirrel. You're so cute. Take a couple of photos, turn back to the Jeep, put the camera away. As I turn back, this squirrel's climbed down the tree and is helping himself to my oats. So I'm like, what are you doing? Those are mine. Grab the camera again and walk over and sit down. And he just hangs out and I share my breakfast with him at this table. And um, here I was at this time thinking that I it was me that was putting off all this terrible energy that was keeping people away from talking to me, not seeing wildlife. And I, tr- I very much attribute connections to, to wildlife and nature and people due to the energy that we give off um, and kind of giving off that allowance of I want people around me or happiness or joy or friendly um, kind of thing. And uh, yeah, and, and I realized as this little tiny creature that I could have just squashed so easily, um, sat there with me and allowed me to share space with it that it was only me that was judging myself it was only me that had this uh, um, bad view of how I was at the time and what I was going through um, and uh, yeah I tell people it taught me the meaning of life and taught me a lot about life just the fact that this squirrel was willing to, to sit there and have a conversation with me um, in a time I thought that I was that a bad person or angry or frustrated um, and it, it gave me that strength to keep going and I if I managed to camp, um, accomplish all the goals that I had uh, paddling um, and then I chatted with my family after that as well yeah it really kept me going so it sounds like the squirrel had such an impact right you kind of shared that you were about to throw in the towel right and it just shows that in anything in life, right? Whether we're on this expedition or whether, you know, we're studying for an exam or we have a big project with work, there's always going to be that turning point, right? So to always have that open mentality that things could change, right? So I'm really glad that you met that squirrel. And something that I actually want to lead to here is life in general, right? It's not always sunshines and roses. I want to just tell you that I think that you've been very courageous and I'm glad that you feel comfortable in this conversation, you know, to open up about, you know, a past relationship that was toxic and not healthy. I I know that could be hard to talk about. So I just want to let you know that um, this is a safe space and that I, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm also happy for you that you've developed the tools, you know, to overcome this. When did you realize when you were in this past relationship, when you realized that the drawings were kind of on the wall? Sure. Um, that relationship it was five and a half years and it was a pretty, abu- it was abusive from the get-go. And I, from that whole um, stubbornness and drive to kind of succeed, but also kind of prove something to people, um, prove that I am like that I am capable of being that person that I'm apparently not all of those sides of things um uh, it it kind of it kept me in that relationship I probably knew from the get-go that that wasn't right um and uh, and really just kind of pushed all that aside and any red flags um and then you kind of get into it and then you're embarrassed to leave because pretend like if your family's helped you in some way, like fun, funds wise, you don't want to let them down. Um, there's all sorts of things. And then at the point of it, when it starts to escalate, then there's fear you're affiliated with the, the side of leaving. You know, it's not right. You know, you should be there once it gets to that point, but you're, you don't know how to leave. Um, and you, you fear for yourself, you, but then you also fear for that person. Um, in my case, I feared for that person of the things that they had said if I left. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that went on for, for a while, that knowledge of, of the bad side of it. Um, and I think kind of the year before I actually left, um, I had a friend while we were moving to Golden, when I said goodbye to, to him, I said, I'd see him next or I, I'd see him next year. And I think that was like subconsciously me knowing that this was going to be my out of, and there were definite thoughts of, okay, being in golden now and having something that's going to keep him there, keep him somewhere with this dog company, with all of the dogs, with that, that commitment, 
there might be an opportunity for me and, and it's a distraction for him that there might be that opportunity for me to to leave or get away kind of thing and not have to worry so much about him following or coming or any of that or me thinking I need to stay because I can look at it as well he's got something I've left I've also helped him build something that he, he has to look forward to and necessarily hold something against me in some way so there was a lot of I think a lot of subconscious thoughts and I think I did think those things a lot too but I couldn't really say um your memory gets pretty bad at that point and you're because you're so running on adrenaline or I was so running on adrenaline um I hadn't slept in probably years um and my body had kind of started to shut down um I didn't have any emotion anymore by the end and um yeah, and eventually I, I had a business trip for my photography back in Squamish, British Columbia, which is about 10 and a half hours away from Golden, which is where we where I first was, where we first had met and were living. And I was back there for a week um, and I was at my, my by far my lowest. Definitely was, I was sleeping in our work van while I was there and I wasn't sleeping. So I, I went to a little pub close by and went in and um sat down at the bar and um I know you want you were you brought up this story earlier so uh, I hope it's okay that I share it now <laughs> um so so I sat down at this bar and there's two gentlemen beside me there's a hockey game on and all of a sudden this puck slides across the the bar towards me and they're like if he scores you're gonna get a free pint but he's already scored a couple goals, so you probably won't. And I like kind of chuckle and look over, and there's this gentleman um, and, and his nephew, and they introduce themselves and start chatting the whole evening. Turns out we have some connections. Uh, uh, his best friend I had worked for, all, all of these very obvious Tabamish kind of things. And for the rest of the week, they kind of take me in and treat me like family. And I hadn't felt seen in years. I, I hadn't really been allowed to have friends of my own. Every, every time I went, it was always about him and um, or that, that partner. It was the first time I felt acknowledged that I actually existed again. And so as I'm heading back to Golden, um, I'm driving and terrified to go back because I would get in trouble with messages on my phone, even if they're from clients. Um, so I don't know whether, I'm, whether I should delete them or what I should do. And I finally pull over just terrified. And the first name that comes up is this gentleman who had slid the puck over his phone, his, his name comes up and I give him a call and really without saying anything, he figures it all out. And he immediately starts helping me put a plan together. He gives me contacts of people he knows in the area of golden that I could go stay with if I needed. Um, and every time that I called him, the next week, as I'm working on leaving, um, every time I called, he picked up the phone. He would walk out of meetings. He was there. Um, and, and yeah, basically, this stranger saved my life. I always say, he says I saved my own life. But, um, yeah, he, he really helped. Yeah, definitely helped me leave that whole thing. Um, but, but with leaving, I had to leave everything. I had to leave all the dogs. I'd been hiding $100 in my camera bag. Um, and I took my one dog who, who I had had before that and um, left everything behind and uh, picked up a tent by the side of the road for 60 bucks from a lady and um, lived in this tent in the woods for seven months. Um, I guess homeless, yeah. <laughs> I have one word and that's courage, right? So um, I know I've already said this, but it took you a lot of courage to open up with this stranger I'm really happy to hear that an expression that I like to say is, you know, you can always take the bad, but with the good, right? So you were going through an extremely hard time in your life, right? But there could always be a good outcome or even a good turning point, right? To, to kind of get back in that positive light. So I'm really glad that this hockey puck moment had an impact on you where you were able to see things clearly, but most importantly, feel emotionally accepted again. 
by someone else to be able to help you, you know, navigate through this situation where you felt trapped, right? So I'm really happy that you had an ally because in most cases, you know, this could go on for years, right? So although it was five years and it was a long time of your life, you know, maybe if this moment hadn't happened, it could have went longer or something else could have happened to you. So I'm, I just want to say, I'm really happy that there is again, a good and the bad. And again, I think that says a lot about you too, right? And I'm sure, I'm sure you have so much to say and, and to go on with that. But something that I want to lead to is I know after this experience, even when you were out of it, it probably didn't always feel like you were still out of it, right? And I know eventually it came to the conclusion that you had PTSD, right? And, and lots of times when people hear this word, they think right away, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, something that I want to hear your opinion on, I know you have a different mindset approach to this. You believe it stands for perseverance, trust, strength, and determination. So how did you come up with this perspective and why do you believe this is so important? So that definitely came about um, after being diagnosed, um, after um, contemplating suicide while I was in that tent. Um, and, uh, and realizing the only way that I was going to get through all of that was essentially on my own. I had to save my own life, which is the reality of all, for all of us. Um, you can, you, there's people that'll help you along the way, but you have to take that first step. You have to go talk. You have to find that strength and courage to go to a counselor. That's you saving your own life, not the counselor. Um, same with going to the gym or anything like that. And so it was once I kind of connected to that side of things, uh, to myself, um, and, and accepted that kind of control as well. Um, that's when I started to shift into that, what I call my PTSD, um, for sure. Um, yeah. And the best part of that mentality was that I was able to then connect to that thought process of, well, if I can get through that, I really, I can get through anything now at this point. It's just that commitment to believing I can get through it enough. And that's putting in that effort to train, to learn um, so I can do it. And whether I, I maybe don't make it to the summit this time, well, I probably, I maybe didn't train enough or didn't do my research well enough to know that it wasn't a good time. Um, and, uh, but that, that mountain, if that's what we're referring to is still there. So I still have that opportunity to go back again. Um, so it's not that I, I can't do it. It's just that I can't do it right now. Um, side of things. Yeah. <laughs> Opened up all the doors to all these expeditions, <laughs> really. Absolutely. And I know that can be really hard for a lot of people, you know, whether, you know, if they're listening right now and, and they can resonate with a lot of this or whether they're someone that is in the healing process, which as, as you kind of know, it's a journey, right? It's ongoing and uh, it takes time, right? I'm really glad to hear that you were able to climb those ropes, you know, and make that change. Something that, you know, I'm curious about is what were some mental fitness tools that you developed to heal and move forward with your life? There's, there's a lot, but there's definitely a few that I, I practice all the time every day. And I unknowingly was practicing some of them while I was in that relationship. And it really got me through it. Um, one in particular was being thankful. So I found myself every day going down when I'd feed my dogs, I'd nuzzle my face in their fluffy necks. And I'd say I was thankful it was me there and not somebody else, because maybe they wouldn't make it through this. And I know I have the strength to get through. And I don't know where that came from. And I didn't connect to that, that gratitude until I, afterwards, till later. And I realized, wow, that was really what was getting me through. I wasn't giving in. Um, and it also allowed me to not have anger at that time or even at any point. I never had this animosity towards this person. I always took this responsibility of the fact that I was there. And I, I had that choice. I was there. I could have left at any point. And I was still there. So I have to take that accountability. And so that's a huge thing is practicing that gratitude, still practicing forgiveness because there was still harm done that wasn't necessary. And so forgiving that person or yourself, that was, that's always a big thing and probably the hardest thing 
is just to forgive myself for for putting myself but also forgive myself for my family through that because I know that they they figured out things and they didn't know how to help and I can't imagine that sort of pain that I had put them through um and then uh yeah the the being thankful for for those experiences because I wouldn't have learned all of my tools without them I wouldn't be the person I I was then and now without those experiences um I wouldn't be as strong mentally and physically as I am without those experiences um and then a big problem my biggest tool is that is fresh air and connection to nature and, and fitness even if that's just going for a walk but every single morning I'm up before the sun and out wake up walk work out is and write those are my my every morning tools wake up walk work out write um and uh yeah getting that fitness and moving that energy that trapped energy within letting it out in every form so physically and then mentally through writing what they're you're writing something that nobody else ever reads or for me I love to share now um that's a huge healing thing is to write and know potentially that my words, whether it's a story of a place or a story of my journey, it may help somebody else in some way or some place. Um, and that, that gives me the fuel every day to continue to do what I do, like these interviews um, and, and open up. Thanks for sharing like those variety of tools because I think there's just hundreds and hundreds of tools out there to mentally be strong you know, and find out what helps us feel better, right? Like I know for me, I know journal writing is huge. I know creativity in terms of, you know, creating something like with graphic design, like I get a lot of fulfillment. Probably my biggest one is physical activity and I I love the outdoors, right? So whether that's trail running or running by the water, right? These are things for me that are my mental fitness tools, you know, that make me feel grounded and make me feel confident and make me feel just really happy. I'm glad you made comments about that because I should have said that those are just the two years, but there's nothing against counseling. It works for other people. It wasn't something that resonated for me. Some people do require medication and I'm not saying don't, that's not for me. There's so many things I I just, yeah, I support everybody doing what they need to do. A lot of the tools that I use are ones that no matter what, they're always going to work for you. So, and they're ones that you don't need an ex- You can't, ha- you can get away with not having an excuse for, and you don't need somebody else to tell you or do you um, like to go for a simple walk. There's no reason you can't find time to go for a 10 minute walk every day. Um, yeah. Th- and, and there's no reason you can't be thankful for something in your life and and forgive yourself like these are things that yeah and there's no excuse not to do um but yeah there's so many tools as you said that um i should not don't think that we're downplaying them in any way anybody that's listening i think the biggest thing is knowing yourself right and and knowing what works and and what doesn't work and being open to try as many tools as you can right because you might not know until you try it that you really like it, right? Something that I do want to ask is, I'm really happy to hear now you're in a relationship in your life and I want to hear about it. I want to hear about this amazing partner that you're with right now. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Oh, you want to hear about, about him, Ryan? Um, so for a couple of years, I was working um, for a nonprofit that was um, a program that... Um, supported first responders, at-risk youth, um, and those affected by PTSD. And I got to, to take, take them out and go camping, teach them the tools that work for me, um, and showcase nature. And Brian was one of our campers. And um, we, we hit it off just as friends, just like I did with everybody, kept in touch. Um, come, what, like eight or nine months later, we both found ourselves in a place where we could connect again and um yeah it uh, we hit it off we were both single and uh <laughs> hit it off and we both were practicing kind of the same tools so we were able to do those together <laughs> yeah our um rcmp yeah is, is the the best 
yeah, the best person. Super thankful for, for, uh, yeah, those, all those experiences leading to, to meeting him for sure. <laughs> awesome. And what does it feel like to be in a healthy relationship? Uh, it's both of us are kind of in the same, same boat of, um, of learning that, um, because we both have our, our reactions to things due to how we've been treated in the past um, and not realizing, well, it's not that that part's not healthy or this is healthy. Like you're supposed to like treat each other in some way. Like you don't have to thank me all the time for like for cleaning up your dishes. You don't have to be all grateful and all this stuff. Like, just doing what a normal person does. That's your partner. Um, so I think both of us are kind of it's like it's brand new. Um, but yeah, and then it, to be like, this is what it's supposed to be like, <laughs> um, but the best part, like we're best friends, um, which is the best part of like, we're able to laugh and joke so much. Um, yeah. And, uh, really listen to each other, um, which is pretty amazing. And because we both know each other's tools and have listened to learn those and put in that time, um, we know each other's routines and it's not something that um there's there's not like a fence taken if one of us is out has to go and remove ourselves and go for a walk because we know well that like that's the tool that's tool rather than losing losing their cool over something you can't control go we go and go for a walk and come back and get hugs and love and or you go outside and work in the shop for a while or whatever it may be um which is pretty amazing to to know that about about a person um, and if support it. I'm really happy to hear that. It sounds like you guys really understand each other, but most importantly that you are, like you said, best friends. So you have a strong connection for sure. And you, you know how to lift each other up rather than tear each other down, right? So it's when we lift each other up that the best sides come out of us, right? I know you have some other relationships in the last couple of years that have been, you know, pretty amazing. Um, so I want to focus on another positive moment of your life. Can you talk about the party that you went to when you were introduced to some incredible people? What was it like to meet Dale Gray Beard Sanders? <laughs> I'm like, where, where is he going with this? What party? <laughs> like, I'm not a partier at all. <laughs> yeah. That's so awesome that you brought that up. So while I was paddling across America, um, I got to meet the most incredible people just in general. And there, there's a pretty tight knit community along those riverways, in particular, the Missouri and the Mississippi. Um, and they're all, a lot of the people are called river angels. So they're people that live along those waterways or those have also, who have also paddled it and respect the water there. And they, they will support you in whatever way they can, whether it's bring you a pizza by the side of the river uh, or, or take you and give you a room in their house for a night and a shower and a home cooked meal, um, all sorts of things. It's absolutely mind blowing. So I had got to meet a bunch of people along the way, um, St. Louis through to Memphis in particular. And at this point now I'm solo on the trip. I had started that trip with somebody else and I had been left solo and these guys all knew it a bunch of people so I had stayed with them um, with Dale Sanders um who uh, yeah if people aren't familiar with him he has a bunch of world records for being the oldest man to hike the Appalachian Trail at 82 years old he's the oldest man to paddle the Mississippi River at like 80 when he was 81 I think was that and he just completed um I think he connected all of the trails along the the east coast to be the oldest to, to connect like through Florida all the way up Appalachian and um, up through Quebec. I believe he just did that. Um, he's crazy, he, but he's like the most high. He, uh, he's uh, indescribable, this man. Um, so I had met him and we had stayed at his house. And then as I become in alone, um, I'm paddling along and I get this message on my phone being like, we're picking you up you're coming to this party. You're coming back to Dale's house. We don't care where you are. We're going to find you. Just get to somewhere where there's maybe a boat ramp or look on your map where there's a road close by and let us know. And we're going to pick you up and we're going to bring you back to Dale's for this party. 
<laughs> like what's so okay sounds good get to this party and it's um an engagement party for dave cornway and his his new wife emma and or sorry a, a wedding party dave cornway is this british guy who has a whole bunch of world records from skateboarding across australia to doing a pedal bike floating thing like around the uk or something like all sorts of crazy stuff and um they all know each other because he's swam the mississippi and done all sorts of things and so he's there and then everyone there has some sort of like world record or biking record just the most incredible people but also the like happiest nicest group of people and they totally took me in treated me like one of their own like they had known me their whole lives and all of them then from then on really were were helping me in a way they didn't realize being that I was solo now and then um, trying to get home from Baton Rouge. They all helped me get get off the river and get all the way up to Dayton, Ohio. And then from Dayton, Ohio, one of them that was at the party took me in, stayed there for a couple of weeks. And then he offered to drive me all the way to Winnipeg, Manitoba from Dayton, Ohio. Um, so, yeah, it all came to such full circle. It was amazing. That sounds like an awesome party. Can you sign me yeah, up? I- yeah, it was just, yeah, mind blowing. I'm really happy that you uh, you had that experience. And uh, I thought it was important to touch on because when I heard about that, I was like, wow, so many incredible people in one room, right? And that's another example of, you know, a group of people lifting each other up, right? So I'm curious, what are some life lessons that you have learned, you know, spending so much time in nature? Um, I think a lot of the ones that I kind of touched upon already that that belief that um that if you put your mind to something you can achieve it you just have to believe in yourself enough and commit to it um and kind of hold yourself accountable to that commitment um I, I i always say that i don't like it when explorers in particular say that um that they're just ordinary people doing extraordinary things i i i really don't like that saying because it makes summiting a mountain or doing some sort of paddling, whatever it may be, it makes it seem so insurmountable for everyone else. Whereas those mountains, anyone can go up them. Blind, blind veterans have paddled the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. Um, Amputees have summited Everest. Like, if you look at it that way, of like those mountains are there for anyone to go up. The extraordinary part are the people that have connected to that ability. And we need to start, it's not an ego thing. It's just a belief. We need to start having that confidence in ourselves. Um, and it, I think that that's a lot of, you go and meet new people. I think that's a lot of the, the things that we're lacking is that confidence just in everything from our confidence and our knowledge or our abilities to do things. Um, yeah, or the strength that we actually have. Um, yeah, nothing's placed in front of us. We don't have the strength to over. Those are some beautiful words. And that makes me just recap this with your superpower of knowing how to believe in yourself and <laughs> encouraging others that they can believe in themselves too, to make themselves extraordinary. So something that I want to lead to here, and I ask every guest who comes on to my show about this is this podcast is to inspire people to achieve greatness and enhance their overall personal well-being. So what is your definition of greatness? Uh, um, I think it would, it would definitely be linked to what we were just saying. I think finding greatness is finding that belief in yourself and that confidence in yourself. I think that's the greatest thing you could ever want. Um, yeah. And that, yeah, I think that would be that would be it. It's not about doing world firsts or, or Canadian firsts or being called to have interviews and things like that. You don't have to be some celebrity in some way or anything. It's that just finding that, that confidence in yourself and um, connecting to it um, and and connecting to your passions too. And um, yeah, I think that's the greatest thing. I couldn't agree more with you. You know, I do think, um, Part of greatness is believing in yourself um, and knowing that you can do it and knowing that greatness isn't born, right? It could easily be made. 
right? And so you have to choose that decision to take the leap so then you can experience it. Who is a future guest that you would like to see on the show? Um, you've had some such good ones already. So I will mention, so the gentleman who gave me the ride, who I stayed with in Dayton, who I had met in Memphis at Dale's place, Tom Helbig. Um, he is the founder of um, Tom Foolery Outdoors. And he just has the most happy, lovable way of life. Um, and his, his partner too, she is so similar. Um, I haven't had the privilege of meeting her in person yet, but um, through, through everything I've seen, she is the exact same way. They both, oh, they both live in vans, um, but is a breed of van. It is painted with pure happiness. It's just the brightest colors. Um, it's this outdoor scene of people paddle boarding and walking and being in fresh air. And it just, it says love in big letters in the back. It's a beautiful fun band. And um, yeah, it, he would be so great um, to chat with. He has biked the circumference of the United States and along the way he would stop in, in communities and do community service. Um, do things, hang out with kids with Down syndrome and things like that. Um, and when when I was there, we did a bunch. I was a part of a bunch of events that he put on when I was in Dayton. And then even when we were trying to get back to Winnipeg, um, his van broke down in a small, very small town called Wawa, Ontario, along the north shore of Lake Superior. And it took two weeks for the parts to get there. So we were stuck in Wawa for two weeks. And all we did was bike around on kids' banana seat bikes in onesies. I was a hippo. He was a dragon. And go and volunteer in the community. So we went and helped the senior citizens um, make their turkeys for their Christmas pies and all sorts of things. That's all like handed out candy. It was Halloween. Um, So yeah, I got really completely involved in the community, went to yoga classes and helped out at the community center. Um, just yeah, he would. He's he definitely spreads a lot of joy and, and goodness. That's for sure. He <laughs> sounds incredible. So um, yeah. I'll definitely add him to the list, and I will be sure you know to reach out to him at some point, and uh, and make sure that uh, you know after we have a conversation together that I share it first with you as well as <laughs> everyone else that's listening right now. And where could our listeners go to connect with you online? The best place to follow my journey to reach me if you want to chat to is on Instagram at Jillian A. Brown Photography. Um, Every photo has writing affiliated with it. Um, There's always links to podcasts and interviews like this. And there's even um, a bunch of highlights from my Paddling Across America expedition still up on my Instagram wall. So you can go back and see day 50 all the way to day 150 on there and follow along if you missed it live um yeah that would be my suggestion for sure on instagram julian a brown photography awesome so i will be sure for everyone that's listening i will be sure to um actually add that to the podcast notes uh so it's one click away for anyone that's listening to follow you know your journey your photos your life experiences Um, And I want to take the last little moment here, you know, to really um, thank you for your time. You know, you've been very generous today, you know, to meet another fellow stranger here online um, and, you know, just open up about, you know, all the amazing highs and lows that you've experienced so far in your life. And lastly, too, I just want to share with our listeners that are listening that, you know, if you're really enjoying all the content that you've been hearing, you know, this is now episode 48, please, you know, like subscribe, and as well as share this, you know, with another fellow friend or family member that you think it could add value or kind of impact because we're really trying to grow this community and create a community of abundance and growth. It's really my passion as well as all my other guests to come on the show to really inspire people to keep living a great life. Thanks again, Jillian, for being here today. Thank you so much for having me, Ben. It was a pleasure. 
Thank you for listening to the Living Your Greatness podcast. If this show has added value, please subscribe, leave a rating, and make a review.